Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. So you may have just gotten a shiny new GeForce graphics card for your system or you might be upgrading from an older one. Installing a new graphics card in your gaming rig is quite simple and straightforward. However, there are some important settings to take note of within Windows and the Nvidia control panel so that your graphics card can perform optimally to give you the best performance possible. Doing many benchmarks and gameplay showcases on the channels over the years, I've gotten a concerning amount of comments from users who have told me they have the same GPU or that their system is configured very similarly with respect to hardware but don't quite see the same performance figures as I do. So in this video we'll be going over those settings and configuration techniques for which I use on my Nvidia graphics card so that you guys can attain the best performance and have the best gaming experience possible. We'll begin by going over the driver download and setup. Now before you download the drivers, if you're upgrading from an older graphics card, it is highly recommended that you uninstall the older video drivers. If you're starting off fresh and not upgrading from an older graphics card, you can skip this step. Now you can uninstall the old drivers by simply going to the Windows 10's app settings and uninstalling all the associated driver packages. However, there is a very useful utility called DDU or Display Driver Uninstaller which you can download for free. And this program specifically cleans out your old drivers. It completely erases the old files, settings, and any remnants that may be left behind so that when you install your new graphics cards, and the new drivers associated with it, there won't be any conflicts which could lead to issues in regards to performance and stability. DDU is also very useful because it gives you the option to uninstall and reboot into safe mode in case you run into any black screen issues. So I highly recommend it if you're upgrading from a different GPU regardless of whether it's an Nvidia or AMD graphics card. Now, I only recommend DDU if you're upgrading from an older GPU or you're updating drivers because you're you were already having issues with the old revision. However, if you weren't having any problems beforehand and are just updating because new game ready drivers came out or you're just simply trying to stay up to date, then all you have to do is just go ahead and install the new drivers over the old ones. Starting off, the first thing you want to do is head over to Nvidia's website and navigate to their download drivers page. However, what you want to do is actually go to their advanced driver search page and I'll explain in a second as to why. Now if you can't find this webpage, don't worry, I'll leave a link down in the video description and for that matter, everything I talk about that has an associated webpage will be linked in the video description. Now the reason why I'm suggesting you to go to the advanced driver page is because here you'll get some more options to configure the driver package. So you'll be given options to narrow down to exactly which graphics card you have, whether it's an RTX 2080 or Pascal GTX 1080 Ti. Selecting your operating system, by now I recommend you'd be using Windows 10. And for the Windows driver type, this is important, you're going to want to select standard instead of DCH. Now, what is DCH? Well, they give a little summary of what it is, and it stands for Declarative Componentized Hardware Support Apps. It refers to new packages pre-installed by OEMs implementing the Microsoft Universal Driver Paradigm. This was something that they started implementing with the 1903 update. DCH drivers cannot be installed over a standard system, and standard drivers cannot be installed over a DCH system. Now the reason why I recommend that you stick with the standard drivers package is because this way you can install the drivers and the NVIDIA control panel will be included. Whereas with the DCH package you'll have to go to the Microsoft Windows Store and download it from there which is just an extra unnecessary step that you can easily avoid. Not to mention with all the issues you hear about from the Windows Store, it's better to just download the standard driver and not have to deal with it. Once you set all your options up, you'll want to hit search and it will bring up a list of driver releases. I recommend downloading the latest one and keeping your machine up to date as there will be new releases coming along. However, one important tip I want to give you guys is that whenever there's new drivers released, I recommend heading over to the Nvidia subreddit or the GeForce forums as there will always be a thread where users will be talking about the new driver and their experiences with it. It's a good idea to read through some of the comments and notes and see what people are saying with the new driver, their experiences and how it behaves with certain hardware. Because oftentimes I've seen people complaining about a driver having issues like black screens or blue screens and sometimes if I don't need to I'll just skip the driver outright. The other thing I want to mention is that when you download the drivers and run the installer, you'll be given the option to download and install GeForce Experience. With GeForce Experience, you can use this program to stream and record gameplay. You don't have to download if you don't want to and you're using a different recording software like OBS or XSplit. I still use it because it's a simple way to quickly record something if you don't have a whole bunch of scenes and 
Instant replay functionality is also pretty neat, but if you're just looking to set up the NVIDIA control panel and just to get the video drivers up and running, then you can go ahead and skip it. Now once the drivers are downloaded, you're going to want to restart the PC. You don't have to do this, but I usually like to take this extra step after installing a set of drivers as to ensure it goes through a full completion setup and everything is applied. Plus, you're all using SSDs, right? Right? So it's just a matter of waiting a few seconds. After your PC has rebooted, the first thing you're going to want to do is open up the NVIDIA control panel. Simply right click anywhere on the desktop and you'll see it in the drop down menu. The NVIDIA control panel as you'll immediately notice has an extremely archaic interface, like something from the early 2000s. Nonetheless, it's simple to use and does the job. I just wish they made something a bit more modern, but I digress. Now the first thing you're going to want to do is, on the left hand side, click on change resolution. You're going to want to make sure to set the resolution that is the same as your monitor's native resolution so that you get the best possible image from it and the sharpest image, and also set the highest refresh rate available. You're going to want to refer to your monitor's specifications so you know which values to look for. Since I'm using the BenQ XL2730Z, which has a native resolution of 2560 by 1440 and is a high refresh rate monitor capable of 144Hz, then those are the settings I will be using. Moving on, you're going to want to click on Manage 3D Settings on the left hand side which will bring you to another page to where you can configure some graphics options that will be applied globally for all your 3D applications or you can even choose to set specific options for specific programs in the Program Settings tab which is pretty convenient. For now and to keep things simple I'll be showing you guys the global settings which I use to ensure my GPU is performing at its best for all my games. Starting from the top, you've got image sharpening. Now I recommend leaving this disabled if you're going to be gaming at your monitor's native resolution. However, if you're gaming at a lower resolution than your native one, then the image sharpening filter can be quite useful in regards to retaining a closer image. For example, on my LG C9 OLED TV, which supports 4K at 120Hz, I actually don't game at, at that resolution and refresh rate since my RTX 2080 doesn't support 4K above 60Hz over HDMI due to the HDMI 2.0 limitation. Therefore, I game at 1440p 120Hz and put on a sharp, sharpening filter and it gives me a pretty good experience as if I was gaming at 4K 120Hz. For ambient inclusion, I keep it off in the global panel settings, but if it's available in game settings, I'll use a certain level of that feature. For anisotropic filtering, you can leave it at application controlled, which means it's something that you'll have to manually set in game. Anti-aliasing, I recommend keeping it off and using the in-game settings, and for anti-aliasing mode, keep it at application controlled. For anti-aliasing transparency, keep it off. Basically, for any anti-aliasing solutions, you want to configure it through the game's graphics options instead. Moving down the list, you've got CUDA, and you want to make sure this is set to all, as any CUDA-based applications which can take advantage of the API can utilize your graphics card. As for DSR factors, which is dynamic super resolution, you can choose to enable higher values in the drop down menu, which all it does is it allows you to set higher resolutions in your 3D applications than your monitor's native resolution. So if you've got a 1080p panel, you can set the in-game resolution to 4K. So in this case, it will render out a 4K image, then downscale it to your monitor's native resolution, which therefore creates a very sharp image and gives your game a visual fidelity boost. However, do note that running 4K DSR will make your games perform quite a bit worse as if you're actually playing at 4K since technically that's what it's rendering at. So if you're playing a really demanding game and your GPU isn't so high end, then I recommend not messing around with DSR. DSR is really useful for those old games that you can run at high frame rates with even mid-range hardware these days, but for new titles, just run them at your monitor's native resolution. Further down the list, we've got low latency mode. This was a feature NVIDIA added to the control panel late last year, and depending on your setup, this option can either benefit you or degrade your performance. Honestly, I recommend keeping the setting off, in the global section at least, as I find it can be hit or miss. Essentially, if you're playing a game which already gives you a crazy high FPS average, like CSGO, Overwatch, League of Legends, those eSport titles, then I recommend not using this feature as it can degrade performance and cause stuttering. Whereas for a game where you're going to be more GPU bound and are getting around 80 to 100 FPS, then you can try turning it on to help reduce latency and lower input lag, which will help your movements and games feel even more responsive. Try this option out on a game by game basis will be my recommendation. So that's where the specific application tab can come in handy. For max frame rate, you want to keep this off as enabling it will allow you to set a specific threshold for where you don't want your FPS to exceed. 
So for example, if you got a 120Hz panel and you don't want your FPS to go above 120 frames per second, to avoid screen tearing that is, then it's a useful option to have here. I'll talk more about Adaptive Sync later on in this video. But I like to get the highest possible frame rate, so I keep this option off so I'm not limiting any, any of my FPS. As for monitor technology, you should choose Fixed Refresh if you've got a regular panel. However, if you've got a G-Sync or G-Sync compatible monitor, then you can choose G-Sync. We'll discuss more about G-Sync later on in the video. For MFAA, which stands for Multi-Frame Sample Anti-Aliasing, I recommend leaving this off as there are better in-game options you can use. For OpenGL rendering, this setting pertains to when you use software like video editing programs, which can take advantage of your GPU to process video under this API. If you got one GPU in your system, which I know most of you do, then you can leave it on auto or actually choose that GPU. Doesn't matter since there's only going to be one option anyway. However, if you have more than one GPU, you're going to want to select the fastest GPU in, that you have in your system. Now for power management mode, select prefer maximum performance. It's highly recommended that you use this setting as it will provide you with the highest performance from your GPU, as it will be able to max out its power draw to allow the car to run at its maximum frequency under a sustained workload for when you're gaming. Definitely enable shader cache, it's a very useful feature that can help boost performance as it can preload shaders textures which helps to reduce rendering draw times and load times. For texture filtering and anisotropic sample option, you want to keep this option enabled as it will work with any DirectX game and will boost performance and image quality, so it's a win-win. For texture filtering negative LOD bias, set this to allow, keep texture filtering quality on performance and as the visual difference between performance and quality is very minor, so you're better off going with the option that will give you a higher average frame rate. Along with that, you're going to want to set texture filtering trilinear opt optimization to on. Threaded optimization is also another really important option, as many users are now using multi-core count CPUs, 6 cores, 8 cores, 12 cores, and more. Games are scaling with multiple threads, and you can use those extra threads and leverage them to help boost performance. Triple buffering and VSync, keep those options off, as VSync will lock your maximum frame rate to your panel's highest refresh rate to eliminate screen tearing. Screen tearing is a visual artifact in video display where a display device shows information from multiple frames in a single screen draw. Usually you'll notice it in very fast paced games like first person shooters, where you'll see a new frame being delivered while the old frame is still there, thus you get this split screen like effect, which can be quite jarring. If you've got a lower refresh rate panel, then screen tearing does become more apparent, and if it does distract you a lot, then I recommend using VSync. The last two options pertain to virtual reality headsets, so if you aren't using one, then just leave it on the default. So we've finally gone over all the settings in the Manage 3D Settings section, and I know there were a lot of th things to go over, but these were the most important settings and it's crucial you have them set right. However, there are still a few more things we can go over to ensure you get the best possible performance out of your graphics card and get a nice gameplay experience. Alright, so the next set of settings we'll be going over will pertain to G-Sync. If you don't have a G-Sync or G-Sync compatible display, you can skip this step. So a quick explanation as to what is G-Sync. G-Sync is NVIDIA's adaptive sync technology that essentially allows your monitor to sync its refresh rate to the game's frame rate. This will therefore create a smoother experience for you by eliminating any screen tearing, any sort of juddering and stuttering. It's very similar to FreeSync, which is AMD's implementation. However, NVIDIA's G-Sync monitors would require a specific proprietary module, which they claimed offered better performance over their competitor. However, adaptive VESA sync, which is essentially what this technology is, can be implemented over DisplayPort and HDMI. So it wasn't until early last year where NVIDIA came out with their G-Sync compatible feature where monitors that had VESA adaptive sync features or FreeSync could use G-Sync with NVIDIA graphics cards. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean every single monitor out there can do it, even if they have some sort of variable refresh technology. NVIDIA does have a verified list of G-Sync compatible monitors, and a lot of monitors are coming to the market with this technology will usually have it. It's more of an issue with older monitors like my XL2730Z, which unfortunately just doesn't work correctly with G-Sync compatible, even though I can enable it in the NVIDIA control panel. So you'll have to experiment with it yourself if you're in a similar situation as I was, but I thought I'd give you guys that explanation and disclaimer as to what you can expect. Now, in order to set up G-Sync, it's actually quite simple. Once you're in the setup G-Sync menu, the three steps are laid out for you. First, click on enable G-Sync or G-Sync compatible. 
Then enable windowed and full screen mode as there are games like the ones from, Micros from the Microsoft Store that only run in a borderless window. So this way you can affirm that all your games will work with G-Sync. Select the display you want to enable the adaptive sync technology on. So if you got two monitors like I do, you'll know which one is the right one as it will have an NVIDIA logo on it. The third step is to check enable settings for the selected display and click apply on the bottom. You'll see your screen black out for a few seconds, but it should come back. Now, we're not done just quite yet setting up G-Sync. There are some settings back in the Manage 3D settings section that we have to go ahead and configure. Where it says monitor technology, you're going to want to click G-Sync compatible. Now, right above it where it says max frame rate, you're going to want to click on the drop down menu. It'll bring up a new box and that's where you'll see a slider to where you can adjust what the maximum frame rate FPS cutoff will be. This is important because G-Sync doesn't work at an unlimited FPS range. There's a specific set of ranges that's different for every monitor model out there, so you'll have to refer to your monitor's specifications. For example, my monitor has a G-Sync range of 40 to 144 Hz, so that is the limit I want to set my frame rate to, which is 144. There's going to be one more setting I want to show you guys in the NVIDIA control panel, and that is the adjust video color options. When you go into this menu, you'll have your monitor or monitors listed, and the second section where it asks you to make color adjustments, Click on the NVIDIA settings, then you'll see an advanced tab. Change the dynamic range from limited to full. For monitors, I recommend using this setting as it provides the best color representation, but for TVs, you're going to want to select or leave it on limited. That's pretty much it when it comes to the settings in the, in the NVIDIA control panel, which I changed to optimize performance. There are some more settings, of course, and you can definitely experiment with them and see what suits your needs. Okay, so now we're going to exit out of the NVIDIA control panel. Open up the start menu from the bottom left hand corner, click on settings. In the Windows settings menu, you're going to want to click on gaming. Then on the left hand side, click on game mode. Go ahead and turn game mode on as it will ensure to terminate any background processes that could hinder your game's performance. I've done some benchmarks in the past and I'll leave some videos down in the video description so you guys can see my results. It doesn't boost gaming performance a whole lot or really at all any noticeable way, but it would be a nice option to have and that extra bit of assurance in case, you know, you do have any programs running in the background that could unnecessarily hog resources. The last thing I wanted to show you guys is a program called MSI Afterburner. You can download it for free from MSI's website. MSI Afterburner is a program that will allow you to overclock your graphics card and tweak settings to boost performance. However, I won't be showing you guys an overclocking guide in this video as we're mostly going to be just focusing on stock. I might make an overclocking video guide in the future, depending on if I get enough requests for it, so let me know. But the reason why I want you guys to download this program, even if you're not overclocking, is simply because I want you guys to set a custom fan curve with this program. And don't worry, even if you don't have an MSI vendor GPU and you have one from, say, perhaps EVGA, ASUS, or Gigabyte, it will still work. Now once you've downloaded MSI Afterburner, go ahead and open up the app. Click on the gear icon, which will open up the settings menu. In the general section, you're going to want to select start with Windows and start minimize. This is so that it starts up right when you boot up Windows and automatically applies your settings. Then click on the second tab which says fan. Here I want you guys to set a custom fan curve and by doing so you'll be able to allow your GPU to run cooler and therefore allow it to sustain a higher frequency boost as it will be operating under a lower sustained temperature. Also another reason why I prefer using a custom fan curve is because a lot of vendors now are implementing this zero stop fan mode, where the fans don't actually start spinning until the GPU hits like 60 degrees Celsius. While this is great for acoustics, because there's literally no noise, it can hinder performance because when the fans kick in, they'll usually start off with a conservative default fan curve, which is why you might see some high temps out of the box. So I like to throw my own fan curve on there and have the fans spinning a bit earlier than that. Now don't just copy what I have, you can use it as a starting point or reference, but ideally you're going to want to make the make a curve which gives you optimal performance with lower temps, but at the same time manages acoustics for your card. Because different cards will be using different fans and acoustics, which will vary between different models as they'll have higher limitations for what kind of RPM they can have. Also, you don't want to just crank up the fan curve and cause the fans to be spinning at the highest percentage or RPM. That'll be way too much noise, you'll just bleed your ears out. So experiment and play around with the fan curve and find a good balance is my suggestion. Well guys, those are all the tweaks and settings that I use to guarantee that I get the best performance out of my NVIDIA graphics card. 
There are certainly more optimizations and tweaks you can do to your gaming system, and if you're interested, I'll leave a link to my PC optimization guide down in the video description, and I highly recommend checking it out if you want the absolute best performance for your gaming rig. I hope you guys found this video to be informative and helpful. Let me know your thoughts down below. Check out the video description on ways to support the channel and for my other videos. If you guys are interested in more content like this, then make sure you're subscribed. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you guys in the next one.